begin reading this morning in verse number one. I was going to, and I was going to try to cram two messages in one today, and just for the lateness of the hour, I don't think we'll be able to do that. We won't keep you here until, you know, four fifteen this afternoon or anything. So we'll have to break it up and figure it out how to cram it all in later in the week. We'll figure that out, won't we? But let's begin this morning simply by, uh, I'll read Matthew 13, verses 1, 2, and 3. And I think you know me good enough to know there'll probably be a little more scripture put in this before the day's over. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. The whole multitude stood at the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables. That's how he spake to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now let's just stop right there. I don't know, maybe I could entitle this entire series this week. You, you hear the, the Sermon on the Mount. Well, this is, this is the Sermon by the Sea. How about that? So what does God teach us about the Sermon by the Sea? He begins to speak to us what he defines as mysteries these parables that are full of mysteries. Now, please hear me this morning. In, in many ways, the Bible is certainly a love story, but it's also a mystery story, okay? There are mysteries that must be discovered and, and, and unlocked. Now, having said that, I want to be very careful to reiterate this over and over again. There, there's no such thing as this private interpretation of Scripture. Somebody has to have this deep revelation at three o'clock in the morning and an angel come and speak to them specifically. And only through them are you going to be able to know the truth of God's word. That's wrong. That's not what God's word says. But having said that, hear me. There's no way a carnal lens can ever interpret spiritual truths. Amen. And that's what Jesus deals with. There's no way that that carnal mind can ever understand and accept the truths of God's word. To try to get a carnal mind to understand spiritual truths, you might as well try to get your bird dog to appreciate opera, okay? It's just not going to happen, all right? It ain't, it ain't out there. But God deals with men and women on spiritual terms, and that's what he speaks about today. A blatant enemy of the Lord Jesus will never, no, never unlock the deep truths of God's Word. It's this book to those that are open to him that he makes truths plain, he makes them sweet. As one man said, it is God's love letter to his children. If you're reading the Word of God and you cannot understand the Word of God, it may be because you're reading someone else's mail. Hallelujah. If you don't love him, there's no way you can understand him. You cannot pry truth out of the Word of God. There are truths that must be revealed by God's Word. Now, the mark of any good teacher, I would say, is to help understand what the complicated is. As one man said, a good, edu a good communicator takes things that are complicated and makes them easy to understand, and a educator makes things that are easy to understand, difficult to understand. And so I don't want to be an educator. I hope to be a communicator this week. Amen. And the, the Lord is the master teacher here. But when I, when I honestly, when I, when I look at Matthew 13 and look at the entirety of all these parables, it's so big, I can hardly get my, my hands around it. it, it there, was a, there was a famous evangelist of years ago. His name was Sam Jones. He was quite an eccentric man. And he made a statement one time. And, and Brother Peter, he said, uh, a, a preacher with a text is kind of like an insect trying to move a bale of cotton. Hallelujah. That's kind of how I feel with this. I can't hardly get my arms around it. It's so big. It's so glorious. It's so deep. It's so true. But it's so moving. We don't move it. It moves us. Amen. I think it was A.W. Tozer who once said, uh, he said, the deeper the truth of God's word, he said, the more difficult it is to express and to preach. And at the end of his life, he said, only twice have I ever attempted to preach John 3, 16. It's just so deep, I can't get my arms around it. <laughs> God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But nevertheless, I want God to help us this week to uncover the truths of these passages, uncover the truths that's found in the Scripture, because it is very relating to where we are today and what is to come. The hour that we're living in, the time that we're living in, and Matthew seven, uh, Matthew th chapter thirteen, these seven different parables deals with what he calls mysteries, and one of the first is this mystery of the now hear this word seeming 
failure of the gospel. Now, don't back out of me right there, but be honest with me. We throw the net time and time again, and for the most part, it comes back empty, doesn't it? As an evangelist, and I say this humbly, but the Lord willing, in a little while, we'll be with Brother Michael Johnson there in North Indiana. And so that means our schedule takes us from near enough the Great Lakes all the way down to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, from South Florida to Western Montana, from Western Montana to Eastern Maryland. Over and over again, we throw the net, we reach for souls. And I don't know how it is whenever you preach, but honestly, here it is how when I preach, most of the time, most people don't respond. And if we're not careful, that will discourage us if we didn't know that the Lord already knew about it and God already foretold us about these things. And when we look at it through His eyes, through spiritual eyes, we say, thank God we're right on track. Can you say amen? We're not to be disappointed. We're not to be dismayed. We're not to look at the wickedness of this world and say, well, Lord, no matter how much we preach and no matter how much we teach and no matter how much we share, the world is getting worse and worse. And so therefore, we must all be failures of what God's trying to ask us to do. No, when we look at it through the eyes of the Lord and through the parables that he's given us to teach us, we step back, we wave a bloodstained banner, and we say we're going to continue the good fight of faith. Hallelujah to God. I want to do my best this week to hope to put this inside of us, because when we see this through the eyes of the Lord, it turns those hurts into hallelujahs. It turns that dismay into a ray. It turns, that, it turns those tears into pearls. It turns wounds back into worship when we see it through the eyes of the Lord. Now understand, Jesus is a master teacher, and no one has ever taught like him. Even his enemies had to admit Never a man spake like this man. I mean, who, who could refute him? Who, 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 who could rebuke him? Who could rebut him? Who, who could convert him? Who could confuse him? Who could confound him? No, not one. And yet little children could look at him and be mesmerized by his teachings. And they would come to him. And they'd find wisdom from him. So if we're taking notes this morning, here's the first point I would point Maybe it's a precursor. Maybe we'll get all the way through it, but I don't think so. So precursor, Roman numeral one, the method of his teaching. The method of his teaching. Matthew 13 and one again, the same day Jesus went out of the house, went out of the house and sat by the seaside and a great multitude were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and, and he spake many things unto them in parables saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now there again, we've heard of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the sermon by the sea. A crowd has come to him so much that he literally has to get on a boat and push out a little ways just so he can be able to speak to them. And it's here at this time that he begins to speak to them in parables. In verse number 10, his disciples come to him and say this question. Question, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now, first of all, we must ask ourselves a question. What is a parable? Well, you can almost hear the word parallel in there. And very much so, a parallel, a parable, it's much very like a parallel understanding of something because a parallel, a parable is this. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, if I was in a class and I was teaching and you were a student and you were taking notes and I were to give an exam, I promise you that would be on the test. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Yes, it's a story. It's a, it's a real story. But there's something more. There's more to the story than meets the what? No, the ear. You're listening, not hearing. I got you. I'm sure in our mind's eye, we see these things. But in these, there's more to it than meets the ear. It's more than a simple story. It's more than a wow, that was a nice ending because there's such a spiritual truth inside of it. There's something for us to grab. There's something for us to internalize. There's something for us to grow from. There's something for us to, to put down deep in our hearts that whenever winds blow, whenever trials come, and they do and they will, we can stand upon his word because he, ta he taught in simple stories, but all oh, the deepness of its meanings. Now there's the method of his teaching but there's also the mystery of his teaching. In verse number 11, he answers and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, 
It is not given. Now, the mystery is this. There are truths in the Bible that cannot be known simply by human wisdom. I don't care how many PhDs you have. I don't care how many gram, grams of gray matter you have between your ears. I don't care how smart you think you are. You cannot simply know this by human wisdom alone. God has to deal with a man. God has to speak. A man's heart has to be open unto the Lord. Paul even speaks, he says, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. They look at it and they say, that's the craziest thing in the world. That doesn't make sense at all. But friend, can I tell you, it's that those that see and believe and can understand that God begins to reveal his divine truth. So now we begin to see in verse number 11, something unfolding, something taking place, something between what, what, what I would simply say is insiders and now outsiders. And before you say, aha, uh -huh, see, that confirms predestination. There's just some people predestined to go to heaven and some people predestined to go to hell wrong. That's not what the Lord's teaching you here me. We'll deal with that. That's not what he's dealing with. Amen. But there is now a classification of people. In verse number 11, he says, there's those I want to give something to, and there's those I'm going to take something away from. Let that speak to your heart. Because you do realize you never leave the presence of God the same way that you came. You either always draw closer or you go further from Nobody stays neutral in the presence of go. God. Nobody shrugs their shoulder at a thrice holy God. Now, they may do it externally, but not inside of their heart. They either come closer or they go further from him. So number one, the, mo the method. Number two, the mystery. The third, as far as a precursor that I would give you this morning, the motive. The motive of his teaching. Well, what's going on, brother? It's just plain and fancy. Here's the motive. You ready? Why does he teach in parables? Two things. Number one, to reveal. Number two, to conceal. To open and to close. To show and to shun. Both of these. Now listen to what he says in verse number 12. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Remember, up to this point, and when we understand the context of Matthew, Matthew is a Jew that is writing to a Jews, but not as if we can't glean truths from this understand. But I'm talking about in the original setting. Here is a Jew that's writing to Jews and Matthew deals. That's why you see Matthew over and over again. And he speaks about it, as it was written by the prophet so-and-so because he's reiterating to Jewish readers that the Lord Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. He doesn't just burst on the scene like you would have the story in the book of Mark. It goes all the way back to the birth of Jesus and the lineage of Jesus and the fulfillment of how he's born in Bethlehem, how he's raised in this certain place and on and on and he's, and he's dealing with Bible prophecy so understand the context that's here in the first 12 chapters of the book of Matthew Jesus is revealing who he is and what he is amen and his motive is always to reveal up until this point now in chapter 13 he changes his pedagogy his style of teaching now in chapter 13 he says uh -huh. I'm going to teach certain things to those people who have certain things. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to see those people that refuse certain things, and I'm going to take away from them the things that they thought were so certain. Certainly you understand what I'm saying. Here are people whose hearts are open to Jesus. And he says, I'm going to start teaching you certain things. Here are people whose hearts are hard toward Jesus. They thought it's, it's the leadership. 
It's people that thought they've got the corner on the market, and yet their heart, their heart is hardened unto him. And because their heart is hardened unto him, he begins to take away that which they already have. Jesus sees a certain people willing for a desire for truth, and he says, I'm going to give you more truth. Remember, truth, amen, when you desire truth, it leads you to more truth. When you deny truth, it leads you to more darkness. Let me ask you this morning, do you desire truth? Here's an ancillary scripture you'd put in your margin. Psalms 25 and 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. And that word meek means able to be guided. Able to be taught. Literally, it reads this. If you're able to be taught, I'll teach you. If you're able to be guided, I will guide you, the Lord says. So let me ask you, are you open? Are you teachable with God? Have you reached the zenith? Have you got the been there, done that, bought the t-shirt mentality? That you're as far as you want to go, that you're as deep as you need to be, that everything's just hunky-dory between you and the Lord? Or is there something inside of your soul that says, oh God, let me go further in God? Is there something inside of you that says, Lord, I need to know more about you than I had before? Can you truly say alongside Paul himself, I have not apprehended what has apprehended me? Paul, wait a second. You have written epistles under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. You've seen multitudes saved. You have established churches. You have, you have literally went hundreds of miles to tell men and women who lived heathenistic life that a man who died on the cross as a criminal is actually the Son of God and they accepted you and yet you say you haven't apprehended it. And he says, yes, I, there's much more for me to grow in. Amen. He says in verse 12, the latter half of that verse, whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that which he hath. Therefore speak I unto them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So why does he do this? Sometimes people say, well, Jesus spake in parables just to make everything so plain, partly but not so. Jesus spake in parables so that people with certain things in them could receive. People, Jesus spake in parables so that people that refuse the th certain things of Jesus would not receive. He speaks of having more abundantly. What's he mean when he says this? Well, let me just kind of give you this illustration. Say you have two businesses that you're starting up and you invest 100000 in each of those businesses. And after five years, one of those businesses is making money hand over fist and the other businesses is seeing your money go down the drain. The wise businessman steps back and says, wait a second. The two guys, different guys I got leading this, this guy's got ambition. This guy's got zeal. This guy's got, this guy's, he's, he's running. And this guy could care less. I'm going to take away from what I have from this and I'm going to give to that that's already doing something. This is not Jesus excluding someone out of heaven. This is not Jesus predetermining that this person doesn't deserve heaven. This is Jesus reaching out to all mankind, and yet there's a group of people who did not want what he had to say, and there was another group of people that desired the deep truths of God. So the Lord says, now I'm shifting what I'm doing, and I'm giving it unto those that desire to hear from me. Here you have a master teacher with his method, its parables, its mystery, its teaching and revealing and concealing and its motives. It's to give and it is to take away. What do you mean by this? It's to take away. To take away from whom? To take away from the very people he intended that it, them to receive it. He goes to the Jewish leadership. He goes to the high council. He goes to the Pharisees and over and over the first 12 chapters of Matthew, you know what he's doing? He's, he's laying, he's laying hands on blind men and they're seeing and they're receiving sight. And he says, look, 
The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what my kingdom is like. He would walk up to men that were lepers and he could heal them. Leprosy, always a sign of sin, a representation of sin. And he's saying, don't you understand? This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Amen. And here he heals men that are men that are blind, men that are deaf, men that can't speak, men that were even dead. He raises a life again. And he says, this is the kingdom of heaven. This is what it's like in my kingdom. There is order in my kingdom. There is peace and my kingdom there's healing and my kingdom there's freedom from sin and over and over the Jewish leaders all they can say is show me another miracle show me another miracle show me another miracle and finally in chapter 12 they do something and they say something and preachers you please help me out with this if, if you see it differently but as far as I can see they Jewish history has never shown this happen before Yes, they forsook Torah in the Old Testament. Yes, they forsook the law. Yes, they, they even stoned prophets. And maybe, maybe the closest I could get to it would say maybe where Isaiah said they called sweet water bitter and they called that which is good evil. They even, they even went so far in the Old Testament to ascribe something evil and called it good. They dance around this golden calf when Aaron is there. And he says, Behold the Lord your God. Now, we don't catch this in English, but in Hebrew, it reads this. Behold the Jehovah your Elohim. He doesn't call it Molech. He doesn't call it Balaam. He, he doesn't call it Ashtaroth. He says, No, 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 no. It's, it's God. It's the, it's, the same, it's the same God that brought you out of Egypt. It's the same God that, that fed you manna from it. It's the same God. In times past, they ascribe the works of the devil to God. But no, never, never have I ever seen what they ascribe the works of God to the devil. Beforehand, they were so audacious, they could say, this devil is actually our God. But at that time in Matthew 12, they're oh, yeah. so audacious has to say, our God. I'm not going to say it. And it's at that point where Jesus turns, and in so many words, and I, can't, I wasn't there, but I can only imagine as he takes a breath and raises an eyebrow and says, all blasphemy shall be forgiven to you against the Son of God. And what he's saying is, you just blaspheme God the Son. And he begins to turn from begins to look to another. What's it teaching us, Brother Estes? Be careful. God always reiterates your decisions. For good or for evil, the road you decide to go on, God reiterates that. You keep choosing darkness and God says, that's it, go that way. There's no predestination here. These are men that have hardened their hearts against Jesus. Remember, here's Pharaoh, and his heart is hardened, but only after his heart is hardened does God harden Pharaoh's heart. Again, God has a way of reinforcing our own decisions. Is that good or is that bad, I ask you? Well, it depends on which way you're going. It all depends on what you decide. Three ancillary points to begin with, precursors, if I will, and if you'll give me just a few moments of your time this morning, and I know you're busy. But the method, that's parables. The mystery, it's to reveal, it's to conceal. The motive, because they have either rejected or accepted truth. Which side are you on? Are you open to truth? Are you open to the truth of God's word? He's able to keep that which you've committed unto him. In the proverb, it teaches that he laughs at that man's calamities. That's, that's not God being vindictive. That is the Lord simply reinforcing the decision that man himself has chosen to make. In Proverbs 1, you can read into that there where it speaks about the, the simple and then the scorner and then the fool. You can see a progression that is there. You, you can see how the Lord reaches for the simple, but then it gets worse. Now they're scorners. I've even seen the Lord reach for the scorners. But if that man so foolishly, so callously, so abruptly just decides to keep going down the road that he chooses, the Lord will not force that man to get saved. 
The old song says, one door and only one, and yet its sides are two. I'm on the inside. Which side are you? I'm going to try my best to get through this this morning rather quickly. So the first parable that we read is about the sower. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and a great multitude were gathered together unto him. So he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And he went sowed. Some fell by the wayside. The fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places. They had not much earth. Some, and forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. When the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. Some fell among thorns. Some of the thorns sprung up and choked them. Some fell into good ground and brought forth fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirtyfold. Then he says in verse number nine, who hath ears, let him hear. To ears to hear, let him hear rather. Now, in this, in this parable, there's three vital objects that you have to keep in mind every time you read this. Number one, the seed. Number two, the sower. And most importantly, number three, the soil. We're going to find out what all this means. What is the seed? Brother, that's just the seed is the word of God. God deals with that in verses 18 and 19. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When one heareth the word of the kingdom. The seed is the word of the kingdom. It speaks of the Bible, the word of God. Why? Because the Bible is, is life. It's a seed that germinates life. Amen. I hate to break this news to you, and I know where I am, and I know, I know this can get a man hurt over here. But I'm not really a hunter, guys. Hate to let you down. I mean, I love it when you guys do it. I love going. Are you kidding? I, I got thrilled last year shooting. I think it was a, like a rabbit or something, whatever, a little rodent or something. But I, I'm a gardener, okay? I'm not, I'm not a hunter. I'm a gardener. And I am fascinated, almost deliriously fascinated with seeds. It's amazing. It's amazing how a little seed... You put this little seed in the ground, it grows legs, it sucks up minerals through those little roots, produces a vine, and I don't know how it does it, but that vine uh, sucks a pumpkin out of the dirt. It's amazing. That's what the seed of the Word of God is like. We plant it. I don't know how it works. We plant it, and God starts producing life out of it. It really is an amazing thing. You say, Brother Estes, everybody knows that's not anything. Look, Charles Spurgeon said, everything's a miracle till you get used to it. Now, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't, don't say amen too loud. But how many of you adults in this room remember the first time you can make a picture bigger by using two fingers? Mm, mm, look at that. That does not impress your grandchildren as much as it does you. I promise you that. And they're like, Dad, that's nothing. Like, no, you don't understand. That's what a seed does. First Peter 1 and 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So a sower went forth to sow. A church that does not emphasize the word of God is not sowing. We can have ice cream socials, thank God for fellowship, but that's not sowing. Now, now I'm not talking about sowing the word of God. Amen. Yes, we need to have koinonia. That's a Greek word for fellowship. And, and thank God for singing. We need that. We, we need the worship. We need even the worship and shouting and the victorious shouting. But over and over again, beloved, we've got to come back to what brings us all together. And it's this divine book. It's not personalities. It's not charisma. It's not the PhDs. It's the Word of God. And a church that it doesn't put an emphasis on the Word of God is not sowing the seed of the Word of God. Jesus himself is the sower. He says, he that soweth good seed is the son of man. But the emphasis this morning is not necessarily on the seed and not necessarily on the sower. It's on the soil. That's what the, that's what the text deals with. And the soil represents this, if you're taking notes. It represents the hearts of men and women. He sowed upon, some fell upon the wayside, stony ground, thorns, and then good ground. Verses 15 and 16, for the people's heart is whack, gross, waxed gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have closed. Thus at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, should understand with their hearts, should be converted, and I should heal them. God's word shows us basic reasons of why people don't come and get saved. Oh, and by the way, he gives this to his disciples and he says, 
This is what the kingdom is going to look like from the time that I leave to the time that I return. So be, get ready for it. Our job is just to scatter seed. You understand that? Our job is to scatter seed. That's what we do. Just throw it everywhere. That's what he's doing. Don't ever look and say, well, that, I don't think that person could ever get saved. You'd be surprised who gets saved. Just scatter the seed. It was in Domino's the other day, and I was getting a pizza for the girls, and, and, and a couple of girls, and, a, and man, there's a guy in there, and I'm, if you just look at him, you're like, mm, I don't think that. And sure enough, I'm like, no, are you kidding? That's, a, that's the exact guy that needs this gospel track. I said, hey, man, would you mind reading this when you get a chance off after work? He says, sure, I sure will, and puts that in his pocket. Man, I, you know, I didn't know if he was going to run me out or not, and he smiles and puts it in his pocket. Uh, you don't know when. You don't know where. But here's the point. Just scatter the seed. Our job is to scatter the seed. Say Amen. amen. But the Lord lets us know just because we scatter it doesn't mean we're going to get the response that we think we're going to get. He didn't. Number one this morning, he begins to speak about sowing the seeds that fell on the wayside. So if I were taking notes in Roman number one this morning, I would write these words, no reception. The wayside is what they would call the sidewalk. They didn't have concrete, but they did have packed down soil. And sometimes we sow that seed. And here's the deal. Their hearts are so hard, they just won't receive it. Friend, how is it when you walk in the house of God every day or every Sunday or every midweek, whatever that may be, I just ask you, is your heart open to what God desires? He says in Hebrews 3 and 7, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. I heard one man say one time, practice makes perfect. I heard, an, I heard another man say back, no it doesn't. Practice makes permanent. Whatever you do, do it long enough and you'll get good at doing it. And friend, can I tell you, if you avoid God long enough, you'll get good at it. You will get good at avoiding God. And man, I have seen him, Brother Johnson, I have seen them get good at avoiding the Lord's dealing with their hearts. They got more, they would make professional basketball stars envious. They can weave, they can bob, they can run, they can duck. They can, I mean, they can pick up babies at the right time. They know exactly when to respond to that text message. They can go answer that important phone call. They've been waiting to get everything underneath the sun to get out from the presence of the Lord when what they really need to do is stay there and say, God, deal with me and Lord, speak to me and help me and let me draw closer unto you. Don't let my heart be hardened, God. You're trying to take the seed of the word of God and put it into me and don't let it fall by the wayside, O oh Lord. Most of the people that we speak to, most of the people that we preach to throughout, this, throughout our generations, you know what they do? They harden their heart toward God. Heard one man say one time, well, preachers just don't preach like they used to preach. I couldn't help it. I looked back. I said, maybe, maybe you don't hear like you used to hear. Maybe preachers are preaching just like they used to preach, but maybe your heart has got a little too hard to hear it like you used to hear it when you were a boy. The things that would prick you, the things that would deal with you, now don't bother you. I've seen it when the Holy Ghost was moving like fire and they were like a burned over stump. Just couldn't be touched. In John 12 and 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, Yet they believed not on him. Now, two verses down, verse 39, the scripture begins to read, therefore they could not believe him. Interesting, in verse 37, they would not believe. In verse 39, they could not believe. Mark that down in your heart this morning. There comes a place where men that would not, cannot. God reinforces their decision. Secondly, this morning, hope I'm not boring you today. Number one, no reception. Number two, no root. Verse 5 and 6, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no depth and deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered. Now we see, now we see a seed that gets in, yes, but it never gets down. It never gets down to where they're living. When the Bible speaks about stony places, 
It's not referring to a group of rocks on the surface, okay? That's not what it's that's not what it's talking about. It's speaking about those fields that right underneath that surface would have been that stone. It had been shallow ground. Over in Israel, you'd see great limestone fields, and it may be covered with a you know an inch, maybe an inch and a half worth of dirt. So somebody said, Well, see, this seed never got in. Yes, it did get in, but it never got down to where they were living. Verse number 20 and 21. He that receiveth the seed in, into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the world, the word rather, by and by, he's offended. Now let me go ahead and prophesy to you. There's going to be troubles and tribulations in this life. You need to get some roots. Hello. You need to get some roots. There's going to be troubles that come. You need to get roots. Friend, there is still a pressing into the kingdom of God. And that which can be shaken will be shaken. Yes, you're saved by grace through faith alone. But the faith that saves us never alone. Faith without works is still dead. Say amen, somebody. Amen here, beloved. Amen. Somebody said, brother, that's just, is it faith and works? No, but it is a faith that works. And if your faith doesn't work, then you don't have saving faith, whatever type of faith you have. Amen. It's faith that works. It's faith that's rooted. It's faith that goes deep. It's faith that stays there when the wind begins to blow. Jesus said, you're going to preach and here's what you're going to find. You're going to scatter seed and you know what you're going to find for the most part? People ain't going to want it. And you're going to find some people that get in, but you know what? They never get rooted and get down. And by the way, can I just add this in for good measure? Good roots don't simply consist of the phrase, well, this is always where we went to church. It's got to go deeper than those roots. Say amen. Good roots go deeper than, well, my dad's a preacher or my granddad's a preacher or my uncle's a preacher or my best friends. Good roots say, I love him myself. I've had an experience with him myself. I'm a born again child of God. He died for me. Now I will die with him. I love him. He gave himself for me. I've been bought with a price. Can someone say amen you got to get roots you got to get roots so deep when you've lost your song you can still sing say amen you got to get roots when the doctor gives you a bad report or the economy goes south or things don't happen like you want them to happen you still hold on to God's unchanging hand Someone asked me, said, are you going to have a rebuttal for Tuesday night's debate? I said, well, you know, actually, I do have an official rebuttal for that debate. I, 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 have, I have an official rebuttal for that debate. I have an official rebuttal for the election and for the post-election fallout, whatever way that may go. Here, here's, my official, here's my official response. Rent not thyself for evildoers. Trust in the Lord, do good. There you go. There it is. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's around the corner, but here's what I know. I'm just going to trust in the Lord and do good. I'm not going to fret myself over what they do in Washington. I'm more concerned about the kingdom of heaven. I'm more concerned about eternity. I'd rather have roots and go deep in God. Can someone say amen? Amen. It's good, brother. You know, we find, I'm telling you, man, as a preacher that goes from church to church, and we're there one year, and man, they're there. We go back the next year, and then they're not there anymore. I thought they were in. Well, they were in for a while. What happened? They just didn't have any roots. I know he said, man, how do I spend time with God? Spend time in his word. Spend time with people of like precious faith. It's amazing how you start growing roots. You start having common stories and common testimonies and com com all these things in camaraderie together. You start getting roots. I've preached long enough to tell you, beloved, I don't put my faith just in somebody's tear on an altar because emotions can go up and emotions can That's go down. And I've seen a man, I've seen him pray. And you know what? I've even seen the old timers used to say this in Mississippi. I don't know if they say this in Montana, but the old timers would say they're praying off conviction. In other words, they're just praying to feel a little bit better, but they're not praying all the way through. Friend, you've got to have reception, but you've got to have roots. Thirdly, this morning, I'll be quick. Number one, no reception. Number two, no roots. Number three, no room. Some fell among thorns. The thorns sprung up and choked them. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word of God and the cares of this world 
and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and, it, and he becometh unfruitful. First we see no reception, then we see no root. Now we see it's a question of room. The first, the seed could not get in. The second, the seed could not get down. Now the seed cannot get free. Something is choking it out. Can I tell you this morning, there will always be a rival crop to your spiritual fruit, and you've got to get that thing out of your spiritual garden. You have got to interrupt the weeds that's trying to take your fruit. I promise you, there are aphids and unseen fungi that's staring at that same tomato you are. Hallelujah. They want it just as bad as you do. There's critters out there. There's everything out there to choke out that life. And if you leave it undisturbed, it will take that fruit. You know what you got to do? You got to disturb it. You got to disturb that old, fruit, the old that old life. You got to disturb those old things. You got to look. You got to look at the deceitfulness of riches. You got to look at the cares of this world. You got to look at all those things, and you say, "I'm not going to let that choke out my life." It's not simply adding Jesus to these things. It's ripping those things out by the root and say, "There's no room for two gardens in this land. It's got to be Him and Him alone." Can someone say, "Amen"? Hallelujah! We live in a world. Jesus told us it would happen. They're going to say, "Well, I don't mind Jesus. I love Jesus, but all Jesus is is just." a number somewhere in the back of their mind. He's not everything. And beloved, he will not live in a duplex. Some have no reception. Some have no root. Some have no room. They never deal with the rival crops against them. Church, you got to deal with the rival crop in your life. You got to deal with that rival thing that's taken the life of God out of you. From the time of the fall of man, thorns represent that which is cursed. There's a rival crop, then, friend. If Jesus is a sideline and not a main, main line, then it's fallen on thorny grounds. Lastly, this morning, and I'll close. Say this with me. It's not the seed. It's not the sower. It's the sower. It's not the seed. It's not the sower. It's the soil. Every time I hear the word of God, word of God, J and Amen. It's not even the sower. It's me, Lord. It's me. It's my soil. It's me having no room for it. It's me having no reception to it. It's me having no roots with it. Friend, it's got to be your heart that says, Lord, I don't want to be like that person that has no refusal, nor the person that has no root, nor the person that has no room. Fourthly, and I close this morning, I want to be the person that says, no refusal. Let my soil of my heart be open to the Word of God. Some fell on good ground, some brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. This is the open heart of the man that hears the word of God with sincerity and does not refuse the spirit of God in his life. So how do you test that Christian life simply this morning? Is there fruit? Have you been changed? Is the Bible real to you? Is Jesus alive to you? I mean this. Is the Holy Ghost real to you? Are you trying to find ways to come closer to the Lord? Again, you don't have to say it out loud, but say it in your heart. It's not the seed. It's not the sower. Lord, it's the soil. Now, now I'm, not, I'm not saying this is... You don't have to take this as proper theology, but this is Zanestis right here. If I, if God, to me, if God ever had a motto, I believe God's motto would be found in Isaiah 42 in verse 8. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give unto another. That's the motto of God. He's the Lord God. Nobody's going to take his glory. So before you say I'm not responsible for the soil of my heart, that's just how I was born, Brother Estes. That's the Irish in me. No, you don't know my German roots and all those kind of piddly things people want to say. I want to tell you this morning, it is the soil and it is our responsibility. 
It's not the seed. It's not the seed. It's not the sower. It's the soil. Jeremiah 4 and 3, For thus saith the Lord, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. But that's just, that's just who I am. That's just what I know. That's just who you are. That's just what you are. That's fine. But here's what God's word says. Break up that hard hearted soil. Look and see if there's no room there. Look and see if there's no place for roots to go deep. Look and see if it's so hard it can't even penetrate through and ask the living God, Lord, don't let me leave the service without having an openness unto you and I might receive of the things of the living God. Let my heart be receptive unto the Lord. Hosea 10 and 12, and I'm trying to close. Sister Estes, you want to help me this morning? Sow to yourself in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Don't tell me you're destined to die lost and go to hell. Some type of predestined thought that's just how I... No, no, no. God says to you today, break up the hardness. Deal with the hardness of your heart. Deal with those things in your heart that's keeping you from being pliable in the hands of the Lord. It's not the seed. It's not the soil. Or not the sower. It's the soil. Now, prophetically, let me say this to the church real quick. This is how Jesus said it would be. He says, you want to know what my kingdom is going to be like? Don't get discouraged. Because here's what I need you to do. I need you to keep spreading seed. I need you just to lavishly let the seed go. And don't worry about who you think will get saved or who won't get saved. Just spread the seed. But just understand, don't be weary in well-doing, church. Because the Lord already gave us insight. He already gave us foresight. You're going to be surrounded by a world that has no reception. You're going to be surrounded by a world that has no root. You're going to be surrounded by a world that has no room. But you just say, God, let me have reception. God, let my heart be open to the Lord. Let me receive of the Lord. Because, God, I've already seen what you do to hearts that refuse the light of God. They see less light, but those that desire light, they see more light. Oh, God, let the soil of my heart be open unto you. I believe God says that to the church. I believe God says to the individual, quit looking at the sower. Quit questioning the seed and ask God to deal with the soil of your own heart. If we're not careful, we can trample on it so many times that it's one more song, one more sermon, and we're out the door. I hope this week God breaks up the fallow ground of our hearts and that once again, every person under the sound of my voice and for those watching in this morning would say, Lord, I need a closer walk with God. I need to be sensitive to the will of God in my life. I need to be sensitive to the things of God in my life. God, it's not the seed. It's not the sower. It's me, God, standing in the need of prayer. You can start anytime time you like, Sister Esther. Stand with us all over this house, church. I sincerely appreciate your time this morning and I know that I've given you much information on this very first day but I felt like I had so much I needed to give to you. Jesus tells his disciples this is what ministry is going to look like gentlemen. You're going to sow seed and most times people are going to shrug their shoulders. Don't give up. Don't get tired. Don't throw, don't throw the seed away and say, well, nobody, somebody wants it. Somebody's hungry for it. I maybe hadn't found them right yet, but I'm telling you, they're out there. And before you know it, you just happen to throw seed at a place you never thought possible. And all of a sudden that person says, hey, I've been thinking about those things. I've been interested in those things. And you look back and you say, thank God. All I can do is throw the seed, God. But you can deal with their soil. You can deal with their hearts. And they can open up to you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and our hearts open this morning, I come to you now individually. I wonder in this house, would you truly be willing to say, God, deal with the soil of my heart. Don't let me get hard to it, God. 
Don't let me get callous to this, Father. Don't let me feel I've reached as high as I can go or has gone as deep as I need to be. Let me see there's a closer walk, there's a deeper way. Oh God, deal with me. Let the soil of my heart find the righteousness of God. May I make room for the living God. God, may I adamantly oppose every rival weed that would try to take your seed away from my soul. I wonder, is there any hearts in this house this morning that would say, Brother Estes, that's my prayer. I want my heart to truly be open to the Lord once again. My hand's up too. Thank you. There's hands all over this house and my hand, both my hands are up too. I want that. Can we come? I'm going to open up these altars to us. Can we come? And can we make an altar somewhere across this front? And if you cannot...